All right, Natalie, we are live in the Facebook group. So we're actually live on my profile. We're also live in the car crash group. And so I'm going to do a brief introduction to you, and then we're going to go into FMLA. You ready? Yeah, of course. All right. So before I, I do my introduction, though, I do want to let everybody know that if you do have any questions, you can put them below. If you If you want to come on stage, I'll actually put the link into Facebook so you can come on stage if you want to. Um, you'll just click the link and then you'll be in the, uh, you'll be backstage. I'll bring you on. But if you also want to text questions, you can also text questions to 314-668-2001. And now let me introduce Natalie Higgins. Uh, she's a graduate of St. Louis University School of Law and the University of Missouri, where actually I first met Natalie. Um, she's licensed <laughs> to practice law in both Missouri and state of Illinois. And I'm not going to read the full formal bio, but Natalie is a, a wonderful employment lawyer. She does both, and to, correct me if I'm wrong, you both do employment, the, the employer side, but you also do uh, represent a, quite a few employees. And you work for currently... Hughes is a Hughes firm. Is that the, the technical name of it? The, the official it's name Hughes firm? H Hughes lawyers. Hughes lawyers. Of, yeah. Hughes lawyers is the name of the firm. Correct. It was something like that. So, uh, but welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Happy to be here and talk about FMLA. Exciting. And I, I honestly, I think generally this is a, can't be a fairly boring topic. Um, and I, we're going to try to make it where it's not that, that boring of a topic. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, it's um, it's boring, but when you need it, you're glad it's there. You know, FMLA is really important for folks who are in car accidents, and you know, a lot of your clients, I'm sure, uh, need to be able to take advantage of it. So, it really, is a big benefit um, that employees need to be aware of, and that employers, um, of course, need to be aware of as well, because it is kind of technical on the requirements. Yeah, so let's let's start with that because I do want to give some context as to why we're even talking about it because we do come up with some situations where the client just can't work anymore and they've got to they've got to take FMLA. So will you talk about you know what is FMLA? So the Family Medical Leave Act provides twelve weeks of unpaid leave to qualifying individuals. Now FMLA leave is sort of this sacred leave that. Uh, qualifying employers. And, and when I say a qualifying employer, I'm either talking about a public employer or I'm talking about a private employer that has 50 or more employees within a 75 um, mile geographic radius. So it's a little bit technical, but generally speaking, if you're at an employer with 50 or more employees or you're working for a gov governmental entity, FMLA leave is going, to be a, is going to be available to you so long as you meet sort of the minimum threshold of both time working for the organization. So obviously you can't work for a week and then, you know, take three months off. Um, but if you've worked um, the minimum hours, which is 1,250 hours, and you've worked the minimum time period, which is about 12 months um, on a rolling basis, uh, then you would qualify for FMLA leave. Now I do want listeners to understand that FMLA leave is one category of leave. On top of FMLA leave, when you're in a car accident, there can be, a, or you suffer any other kind of personal injury, there can be any number of other types of leave that might apply to your situation. So we could be looking at um, if it's an on-the-job injury, a work comp situation where you might have overlapping workers' comp leave and FMLA leave. You might also have a situation where it's not an on-the-job in, um, injury, but nevertheless, the person um, is ultimately having a permanent disability. When you have a permanent disability, there are requirements under the Missouri Human Rights Act un and under the ADA that require um, an employer to engage in what's called the interactive process to determine whether or not the individual can um, return to work and perform those essential job duties with or without an accommodation. So again, I do want to I do want to be clear that. While FMLA is really important and uh, provides job protecting leave, um, there are a lot of other types of leave that employees need to be aware of um, in, in order to navigate what happens after I get injured. So I guess, how does the, how does the employee need to bring this up to their, to their employer? I mean, they just go up one day and say, hey, hey, HR rep, you know, I, I need to take FMLA. Like, like what are the things that they've got to do to, to make sure that they protect themselves? 
Right. So the first thing you want to do is, uh, you know, if, if it's after you've been in an accident or after you've had an injury, I would say the course of action is going to be different than if we're doing this in a proactive, well, how do I, how do I prepare if I ever need FMLA leave? If you, if you don't have any immediate situation, I would say go to your employer's policy, um, make sure you understand what their reporting process is. Um, generally speaking, if you need FMLA leave for a foreseeable reason, you need to give 30 days notice or as much notice as practical. So if you go into a doctor and they say, oh my gosh, we have to have surgery in 10 days. You obviously didn't know 30 days ago, you can't give 30 days leave. But you know, if you have another qualifying reason, let's say you know you're, you're getting ready to have a baby, you're at month eight, you know you're gonna need FMLA leave for maternity leave, that's foreseeable. You're going to be providing that notice with that within that 30 day window that's required to get to sort of vet the leave um, and to grant it. So um, all that to say, if it is something beyond that, so you get in a car accident, let's use, or you have some other sort of accident, whatever it may be. You, <laughs> it's snow apocalypse at my house. I don't know about everybody else, but you slip on the ice, you bust your knee, whatever it is. So that's not foreseeable. So what you want to do make sure you um, don't just not show up for work. So if you can at all, if you're, if you're capable of picking up the phone and calling in pursuant to whatever your employer's you know, notice for a call off is, make sure you do that. And then on top of that, make sure um, they understand um, why you're gonna be out. So if, if you've fallen and you've already gone to the doctor and the doctor says you're on bed rest for 10 days, um, that would be a qualifying reason under the FMLA under the FMLA Act, and you would want to make sure that you get the documentation from your employer and get it remitted back to them as quickly as possible. So obviously, you're going to be on leave before you actually get it qualified as protected FMLA leave, and you want to do everything you can to um, be cooperative with the employer to get them whatever documentation they need from your physician so that they can categorize it quickly and make sure that your leave is protected. And again, the, the real incentive for doing this is it's unpaid leave, of course. So, um, you know, that in of itself is not terribly attractive to people, but it protects your job. That's the important part. It's protecting your job if you have to be out because when you return, they have to put you in a position that's equivalent. So either your same job that you were away from or an equivalent job in terms of pay, schedule, you know, general duties, that sort of thing. What if, but what if that job, like, what if it just doesn't exist anymore? So let's say that just out of just bad luck, let's say you're in a crash on, on like today, right? But like in a week, the employer has plans of removing that position anyways. Like, do they still have to find a spot for you? No, they don't have to keep open a position that is no longer going to exist. So yeah, there could be, you know, certainly unfortunate situations where an employee goes out on leave and then goes to return and that position is no longer in existence. Um, but generally speaking, short of a total elimination of a job or category of jobs, as it may be, um, they would have to reinstate you to your position or an equivalent position. Okay. Uh, I mean, and during this time, is there any way that the, the employees can get paid while they're off? It really depends on the employer's policy. So under Missouri law, we don't have mandated paid leave of any type. So it's going to be dependent upon your employer and what their policies say. So if they have policies that allow you to overlap some type of PTO vacation or sick time, um, you generally speaking will be able to take that in a concurrent manner with your FMLA leave. I represent a lot of employers um, rarely are they going to allow you to take your 12 weeks unpaid and then take your leave. Almost always policies are written so that you have to take whatever paid leave you have in a manner that's concurrent with the FMLA leave. Um, and that's again, so you're not taking 12 weeks of FMLA leave and then, you know, come saying, oh, well, and now I'm, I'm back and I'm going to take five weeks of PTO. Um, you know, it's, it's too much of a burden on the employer. I will say, though, you also want to, if you are out for an extended period of time, short of some, I mean, there are certainly some professions where individuals are likely to have a significant bank of time that they could take potentially the entire period of FMLA leave in a paid fashion. 
healthcare, um, fire and EMS, those types of industries, people tend to accrue a tremendous amount of leave, which may, you know, work out in your favor if you if you do ultimately wind out on FMLA. But short of that, you also want to check with your employer to see if they have any other benefits that would apply to you. So um, if they have short term disability coverage, that can be a stopgap for the remainder period of your um, of your FMLA after you exhaust whatever PTO or perhaps in lieu of you exhausting your PTO. So certainly explore that option. And then, of course, if you're going to be out longer than 12 weeks, I, I think that's generally the threshold for long-term disability benefits kicking in. So do look and see, again, if you're if you're thinking about this just for planning purposes and there's nothing immediate going on, just make yourself aware of what benefits there are available. And if you are in a position where you are already injured and perhaps already out on FMLA leave, you know, you certainly want to be exploring those sooner rather than later because some of those benefits, even if you apply now, might be able to be retroactive through the date of the injury. So explore those options as well. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, but before I, I get to that, and you may have already addressed this, and sorry if you did, but is, is there like a minimum number of days that you have to take if you go on on leave? No, no. Okay, and so. in fact, and in fact, um, FMLA leave is specifically designed um, to be uh, so that it can be hypothetically used in an on an intermittent basis. So if you've got um, some sort of cyclical or recurring um, type of disorder that maybe has flare ups where you've got fibromyalgia, you have IBS, you have some type of, again, just disorder that isn't all the time, but does flare up and requires you to have time off. You can take FMLA leave um, on an intermittent basis, but you, again, you're going to want to go to your employer's policy and follow the procedure that they set for you to make sure that you're not accidentally you know, not showing up for work and, and getting terminated based on a no call, no show or some other policy infraction, because I have seen that happen. And it's unfortunate, you know, people are, you know, coping with whatever medical issue, and then they sort of neglect their employer. And it's very clear that under FMLA leave, uh, or in order to qualify for FMLA leave, you also have to meet the notice um, obligations to the employer. You have to keep them apprised as to what's going on, at least within within reason. Gotcha. All right, so let's get to our, our first question. Tracy says, what exactly happens when FMLA overlaps with your injury leave or workers' comp? Say you requested FMLA before you were injured on the job, it's approved, and then you were injured right before your FMLA starts. How does that work with workers' comp, work restrictions, and FMLA? So I guess I don't I don't know specifically it, uh, there there could be a lot of nuance. I'm not exactly sure why you would be at work, you know, after you've requested FMLA leave if there's like a future surgery or um I would sort of say they're probably independent at this point, but um in terms of if they're separate issues, so the on the job injury is something different than the FMLA, but that all that to say your work comp injury could also um, be something that justifies FMLA leave. So you might have two reasons for FMLA leave instead of one. Gotcha. Okay. And then we got one from Mindy. And by the way, anybody that posts in here, you can also come on stage if you want to put the, put the link in. And, and so if you want to clarify your questions, you can always come on and, and ask your question too. But Mindy wants to know, what about when you return from your leave and the employer finds a spot for you only to then turn around and terminate you? Is there a law that protects you? Yeah, I mean, FMLA leave is designed um, to protect individuals. It does have a retaliation component to it. So um, if you believe that you were terminated because you exercised your rights under FMLA leave, that is a cause of action. Um, and so if I were you and I suspected that, in, in fact, that's what happened, I would be looking for a lawyer to, to determine whether or not um, that was that was something that, you know, I was un unlawfully terminated or if there was a legitimate business reason for it. So again, we're in the middle of a pandemic, lots of businesses are suffering. So it's hard to, without knowing more facts, know what the basis of the termination was. So what's, I guess, what's the triggering event? I mean, are you just automatically protected by FMLA if you're in a crash? Um, or like, do you have to go to your employer and say, hey, 
I want to take FMLA, FMLA leave or like, what if you're just like, I, I'm sorry, I can't work. And they're like, no, you're fired. Like, how does, like, how does that work? Right. So you have to give the employer enough information that they should know it's an FMLA qualifying event. So you can't just say like, well, I just can't come to work and not give any other specifics. But if you say I can't come to work, I was in a car accident and I broke my leg and now I'm bet, you know, stuck in bed at home until I can get back to my doctor or whatever the case may be. I have to give enough information to my employer so that they can say, oh, this is an FMLA qualifying reason. That's going to trigger, hey, here's the paperwork. You're qual you're qualified for FMLA leave. You need to, um, you know, fill this out and, and make your request. And, and then again, that would be a retroactive situation, but you get the point. No, I mean, that's a, that's a good segue into a question I want to ask you anyways, is like, I mean, if they ask you for medical documentation, do you have to give them like a HIPAA release so they can get the records? Do you have to take the medical records? Um, you don't, there's not, there's not one single way of doing it. Giving an employer an authorization is certainly a simple way to do it. And oftentimes for the employee is the simplest because you just want them to get the records they need so that you can be on your leave and not worry about it. Um, getting, giving them um, an appropriate certification from a doctor is another way of doing it. So, no, you're not forced to give an authorization under FMLA, but sometimes that's the simplest option that folks pick. Hey, what, well, what if you take documentation to the employer and they're like, no, I, you got to get a second opinion. I mean, can they make you get a second opinion? Yeah, they can. They can get a second opinion. And then I believe they can also get a third opinion at their expense. Uh, you know, that type of situation is, is usually when we see something where we're suspicious that the leave is being abused. I will say in all my years of practice, I've never seen that. Uh, generally, certifying the leave is not a contentious pro process. Okay, so I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. So they can make you get the second opinion at your expense? No, it's at, it's oh, okay. at their expense. Got you. I didn't know if the, like the third one was at no, their expense. So okay. If you get a, a first opinion and a second opinion and they're the same, then that's the opinion. If you get a first opinion and a second opinion, the second opinion conflicts, then you get a third. Um, but again, that process in my experience is not, uh, not, not usually something that you see. There would have to be something particularly odd going on um, for them to be challenging it to that extent. So it's interesting because like this, it, it seems like the, you know, quote unquote, serious opinion seems to be sort of like a, a term of art. Um, like, so like, how do you, like, cause you have to establish it's a serious condition, right? And that right, what it is? right. Yeah. Like you're not going to take FMLA leave because you have a cold. You need to. Like what, like what constitutes a serious, like what, like, like what the, constitutes a serious condition? It's actually defined in the statute itself. Um Generally speaking, we're talking about an overnight stay in a hospital, um, a chronic condition that would qualify as a disability. So something that, you know, substantially limits one or more uh, of, of general life activities, um, pregnancy. Again, we're talking about not like a, not a cold, not a sinus infection, but something that's more serious than that in terms of uh, you know, the person's ability to work. So, all right. So let me give you a scenario. Let's say that, you know, you're my employer. I come to you and I say, Hey, I, I, I was in this crash. I can't work. Um, my, my, my broke my leg, so I can't go to court. Something like that, whatever. And you're like, and then you, you let me go on leave. Like, can they then after the fact, after they let you let me go on leave. So you let me go on leave. Like, can you like a week later say, hey, you, you got to give me certification or prove that you that you're seriously injured? Like, can you do that after the fact? Well, under FMLA leave, the or under under the obligations that the employer has, once they know that you have that qualifying reason, it should start that FMLA process. That means them providing you with the form, you turning that in and then them treating it as FMLA leave. So, yeah, I mean, they could qualify it on. Um, an intermediate basis as FMLA leave and then request the follow-up documentation, I think that that would be appropriate, you know, especially if someone is going to have a hard time getting around, maybe getting to a doctor to get whatever the certification is. But I believe that the request has to be 
issued within five days. So again, it's really about that triggering event and sort of starting on the employer side, the notification process of having the employee submit the application, um, vetting it, looking at the supporting documentation, and then issuing um, the classification letter um, that states whether or not the employee is going to have to have uh, any kind of return to work verification. So again, doing sort of the EM, thinking about this from EMS lens or um, any type of physical labor, if you have a serious uh, physical injury yourself, it's very likely that your employer is going to require some sort of fitness for duty return to work clearance from a qualified medical professional, and they have to tell you that in the, in the paperwork. So this is just as this is just as important from the employer side in terms of making sure the documentation is done correctly as it is from the employee side. Again, making sure you're following all the rules in terms of letting them know why you're out giving them enough information so that they're on notice that it's an FMLA qualifying reason. And then you also complying with whatever supplemental information they need from you. So you mentioned something I was going to ask you about this anyway. So I want to ask, I'll do, I want to do a follow up with that is, so you, let's say you go, you go through, you get all the care that you, that you need through your doctors and um, you're ready to come back. I mean, can they make you go get like a physical or something yeah, like that? They can. Okay. Yeah, they can, but they have to tell you, they have to tell you at the time they certify the leave. There's a, there, if you look at the, these forms are online, they're, they're set forth by the department of labor as to, as to what employers should do. And you have to certify that at the time of leave. In addition, when we're talking about a return to work, we have to be talking about return to work in terms of the reason leave was granted. So if you go out on leave for a broken leg they can't make you do a full body, you know, return to work and make sure that everything, your eyesight is great. And the, the return to work information has to be limited to the reason for the leave itself. Are they able to reach out to your doctors and ask them questions? If you give them an authorization. But they can't require it? They cannot require it, no. Nice. I guess, so what's, <laughs> I mean, they, you, they can't make you give give medical records either, right? Or, or can they? They can't, they can't, but they don't have to certify your leave if you don't provide enough documentation to demonstrate the basis for the leave. So gotcha. that's why it's a, it's a mutually beneficial, you know, it's a mutually beneficial process for, for both parties. I mean, I don't see, I don't see a lot of incentive for an employee to be super evasive about the reason for the FMLA leave. So what if you just have a jerk employer? So you, you, you go, you give the medical records uh, to your employer and there's like, no, it, we're, you're fired. Like, this isn't good enough. I mean, what's your recourse? Um, what's your recourse? I, I mean, if they have impermissibly or illegally denied you FMLA leave that you're entitled to, I, I would think you'd want to consult with a lawyer about that and you might have a cause of action. Um, under the FMLA remedies provisions, generally what we're talking about, um, they do have some equitable remedies, so reinstatement. Uh, but generally speaking, what we're thinking about is lost wages and attorney's fees as, as being your compensable damages. So certainly if you go in and you say, I need FMLA leave, you know, I'm going to have a baby and they say, well, no, you're fired. We're, we're not going to, we're just going to, we can't, you know, hold your position. Then yeah, I'm certainly going to go get a lawyer and, and explore what my options are. All right. So I was going to ask you another question, but I want to, I want to follow up on that one. Let's say that my wife's having a baby. Can I take FMLA for that? Um, well, so generally speaking, you can take um, FMLA leave for the serious uh, health condition of a family member if you have to take care of them. So if it's a situation where your family member, your, your wife needs additional care at home, you know, there's some kind of complication, that certainly could be something that's FMLA qualifying. But just generally speaking, um, unless you're, unless it's, you know, just to, to take, uh, to bond with your, your son or daughter, that, that's another classification that's sort of separate than what we're talking about, which is the individual. So I guess the answer is yes, as long as you, you know, as long as you fall within one of those two buckets, it's not just um, paternity leave as, as we're sort of seeing a trend in, 
employers providing. It has to be um, to, to care for that new son or daughter, to care for your wife, something along those lines. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna follow up to this certification stuff. So let's say that I, I go on leave, um, you're my employer, you, you approve it. Can you then every so often say, well, we need you to recertify and prove that you're still injured? I mean, can they, can they, can they do that and how often? Um, so it's gonna depend on what their policy says. It can't be unreasonable. Generally speaking, what I see with employers is having an employee check in on a set peri periodic um, interval. That said, if, if it's like a set, a set recovery period, so we know you've had knee surgery, we know you're gonna be out the full 12 weeks, then we might not have that employee check in until you know, two weeks before the return to work. Conversely, if it's go, we go out, we have an employee go out for an indeterminate, you're in a car accident, we don't know what's wrong, we don't know how long you're gonna be out. We might have you checking in every 30 days to give us a prognosis. So there is, you know, certainly some discretion that can be written into your policies. We, you obviously can't harass an employee. We wouldn't want you, you know, saying you have to check in every single day or anything like that. And in terms, in terms of your question, I think you're you're talking about formal recertification and submission of medical records. I don't think you can do that more than every 30 days. But even then, I think what we're talking about generally is a is a check-in process, not necessarily a recertification. At least that's what I've seen. And I, I'm getting close near the end uh, of my questions, but the I, I've got a question about whether or not um, you can still accrue like vacation time and benefits during the time that you're out. Like for example, like some companies, like you get so many days of vacation for every month that you work. I'll just use that mm -hmm. as an example. Like, can you still accrue that time or does it just depend on whatever the company's policy is? It would depend on what the company's policy because they're not required to provide that. I think generally speaking, those um, those benefits do not you know, continue to accrue, but the employer does have to keep any health benefits that you have um, in place during the duration of the FMLA leave. So that is a major benefit as well. The, the health care, if you have health care through your employer while you're on FMLA leave, now you may have to pay for it out of pocket, again, depending on what the plan documents require, um, but they have to keep you on the health care. They can't say, oh, well, you're not working. So, you know, find your own health insurance for the next 90 days. Does FMLA apply to part-time employees as well? No, you have to be full-time. Okay, full-time employees that doesn't apply to part-time employees. I'm assuming that means it does it doesn't apply to seasonal employees either. Correct. You have okay, to meet you have to meet those qualifying employed for a year and and at least work the twelve hundred fifty. So I guess you could have someone that's maybe not full-time every week that hits the that is able to meet the threshold. But generally speaking, what we're talking about is a full-time employee. Gotcha. Okay. What am I leaving out? Did I cover all the major topics? Um, you know, I think that employees might be uh, interested to hear about the distinction between traditional FMLA leave, which is what we're talking about, and the leave, the expanded family medical leave, and the short, um, the um, intermittent leave that was provided under the Family First coronavirus. Um, you know, I think that a lot of employers struggled, frankly, with doing it right. And so if you're concerned that you weren't treated fairly because you don't think that they followed those two, um, those two sort of short-term paid leave provisions, again, so the expanded family medical leave applied to individuals who were, you know, sort of sequestered or at home um, to care for children whose school was canceled. That was generally what it was created to do. So if you have an issue and you think that you weren't paid properly for that type of leave or you were denied it, um, you know, there's still a lot of questions that people have as to how that was handled. Now, employers are no longer required as of January 1st to provide that expanded family medical leave. And they're no longer um, uh, required to provide that short term um, paid sick leave, you know, that supposed, was supposed to reimburse employees if they were quarantined or, you know, at home isolating because of a because of a COVID exposure or, or a positive COVID test. So those are certainly things we expect to be litigated and 
and people to have claims because employers did have a hard time figuring out what their obligations were and making sure that they were providing that leave um, to employees. I love it. All right. Anything else I'm missing? I'm missing. I want to make sure we got everything um, that, no, that would apply to people. I think it's pretty good. I, I guess my takeaway would be if you, if you are in an accident, you know, be as cooperative as you can with your employer. You know, certainly if you are working with Tyson as your attorney, um, anything, any questions you have, reach out and make sure that you aren't doing anything to jeopardize your job. You already have enough. <laughs> you already have enough complicating factors. We want to do everything we can to pre preserve employment and and make sure we can get you back in the workplace. So that, that's all I would say. All right, Natalie. If anybody has an employment issue, because this isn't the only thing you do. I mean, you handle employment issues all the time. Mm -hmm. How do they get in touch with you? Oh, uh, sure. Well, my uh, my firm is Hughes Lawyers. You can Google us and find us. My email address is uh, Natalie at Hughes Lawyers LLC dot com. I'm sure you can put it in a comment. Um, that's probably the best way to reach me. I'm working largely remotely at this point, but uh, that's email or phone call would be would be just fine. Perfect. I love it. Well, thanks for doing this. I really really do appreciate it. Anybody that's interested in our Facebook group, it's free to join professional advice after your car wreck. And we just have a lot of great information like this. Uh, we, we'll be doing these weekly and we'll, we'll have daily posts about uh, car wrecks. So whether it's a property damage issue, an injury issue, FMLA issue, whatever it may be, uh, we'll be talking about it there. But Natalie, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. See you later. Don't go anywhere. Okay. <laughs>